So uh, it's great to be here. Thank you, Anthony, for inviting me. Great to have Aaron uh, also on the panel. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, uh, emotion regulation and borderline personality disorder and what we may be able to learn from neuroimaging that can point us in some directions in terms of therapy. So uh, as everyone in this room knows, borderline personality disorder is really characterized by affective instability as a major feature of the disorder. Sudden shifts of mood from one state to another happening over a period of hours, uh, often in response to psychosocial events, and emotional uh, shifts that are quite extreme and then take a long time to kind of get back to baseline. So we wanted to study um, and try to understand more about this emotional uh, affective instability in borderline patients. And one of the things that we decided to look at is the processes that people normally use to regulate their emotions. And we had the hypothesis that maybe borderline patients were not able to use these processes as effectively. And um, among the cognitive processes that are used, um, a number have been identified um, by um, Gross at uh, Stanford and Kevin Oxner at Columbia. And one of the processes that's particularly adaptive and used by most people to regulate their emotions is cognitive reappraisal. And that's creating a cognitive structure to kind of reframe a disturbing situation to make it less disturbing. Um, and there are two two uh, tactics that people use for cognitive reappraisal commonly. One is what's called situational reappraisal, and that's where you create a narrative for a situation that makes it less disturbing. So you're going to visit a friend of yours who's just been very sick and he's in the hospital and it's obviously very upsetting to go visit your friend, but you sort of create a narrative that, well, he's finally in the hospital, he's at Mount Sinai Hospital, so he's going to get really great care, and it, it allows you to feel less bad about the situation. So that's situational reappraisal. And the other kind is reappraisal by distancing. And that's where you assume um, a kind of emotional distance from what's disturbing. You know, it doesn't really affect me. It's happening to somebody else. It's far away. And this is uh, um, a reappraisal technique. For example, uh, an intern working in an emergency room. You know, someone comes in, they've been in a terrible accident. It's very disturbing. And yet, to function effectively, the intern has to be able to be emotionally distant. So he assumes a clinical distance. It's a very adaptive technique. Well, we hypothesized that maybe borderline patients couldn't use these techniques as well as healthy people. And we decided to look specifically at one technique distancing. And, and that was because we felt clinically that borderline patients kind of get emotionally over-involved in everything, and it seemed that they'd have more trouble with distancing. And um, so I'll show you the, the first study. Well, let me first uh, show you what uh, is known about the uh, parts of the brain that are involved in distancing. This is from uh, a paper by uh, Kevin Oxner's group. And the main regions that are involved when cognitive reappraisal is being used are um, the uh, um, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex uh, here, which is involved in, as you know, in working memory, but also in attention direction. Um, the ventrolateral prefrontal cortex, um, some regions of the, the parietal uh, cortex, which are also involved in attention selection. Um, and the dorsomedial frontal cortex involved in attributing mental states. So keep these regions in mind when I show you the fMRI pictures that we, that we gathered. So um, the first study we did was just to see what's going on in borderline patients when they try to use reappraisal by distancing. And this is the uh, task that we used in the scanner. We would have subjects come in, and we would show them uh, pictures that were emotionally uh, salient pictures from the affective, in, affective uh, uh, IAPS picture series. We showed them either negative pictures like this one or neutral pictures. And we asked them, when they're looking at negative pictures, for half of the negative pictures, 
to use reappraisal by distancing, and for the other half just to let themselves look at the pictures and feel whatever feelings came so that we could see the difference in what was going on in the brain when they were looking compared to distancing. And this is what we found. We found that in um, healthy controls, there was an increased activity in the dorsal anterior cingulate while they were distancing compared to uh, borderlines. And if you unpack, this is a double subtraction picture, and if you unpack the bold activation in this region, you see the blue line represents the healthy controls, and this is the activation in the look condition, and this is in the distancing condition. So they're, they're increasing their activation with the distancing. The borderline patients are not doing that. If anything, they're decreasing their activation. Another area in this whole brain analysis where we found a difference between the two groups was in the uh, intraparietal sulcus region and the parietal cortex, again, where healthy subjects increased their activation when they were distancing and borderline patients did not. Uh, and this is a region that's also involved in attention allocation, which makes some sense when you think about what's, what you're doing in your head when you're distancing. And what's going on in the amygdala? Well, in the amygdala, we found that, um, as we would expect, the reverse. So healthy people, when they distanced, were able to downregulate the amygdala, and the borderlines uh, were not able to downregulate. If anything, it increased in activity. And this is, makes sense, of course, because these frontal regions that I showed you in the previous slides downregulate the amygdala. So. Um, after we've, we did this study, we wanted to see whether or not we could actually train borderline patients to use distancing more effectively. So we developed a uh, training program, a four-day training program, where the subjects would come in, we would get a baseline fMRI image, and then we would train them uh, each of four days um, by having them uh, look at um, these pictures with our research coordinators. I, I don't know. Uh, if uh, Antonia McMaster is in the room, or uh, uh, yes, she's here, so she's actually done this with subjects, and uh, Maria Lopez also uh, uh, has done this with, with our subjects, sat down with the subjects, had them practice distancing, sort of shape their behavior, and then we had them distance uh, for 24 pictures and look for another 24 pictures each day for the four days, so they practiced distancing for 97, 96 pictures, and then we brought them back and imaged them again. And then uh, in this study, we brought them back two weeks later, uh, and I don't have the data on that yet, but we wanted to see to what extent this, this change might endure. Um, so uh, this is the, uh, the design of, of the study. Um, we randomized our borderlines and our healthy controls to two conditions. One was the distancing training condition, and the other was a look-only condition. So the subjects came in, they saw the same uh, delightful research coordinator each day, they sat and they looked at pictures, so they're the same amount of contact, the same amount of exposure, but they didn't get any training in distancing. Um, and then they came in on day one, were scanned, practiced, and then on day five were scanned again. Um, and uh, I'm going to show you data that we've analyzed on half of our sample. We just finished the study, so we have twice as many subjects as on this slide, and we're in the process of analyzing that now. So uh, this is data on 14 borderline patients who are in the distancing arm, uh, 16 healthy controls in the distancing arm, 11 borderlines in the control condition, and 13 healthies in the control condition. So let me show you what's going on um, behaviorally. So you remember from that first slide of the task that after the subjects see the picture and they downregulate by distancing, we ask them to rate how negatively they're feeling about the picture they just saw on a scale from one to five. The higher the number, the more negative they're feeling. So um, the uh, red bar are the healthy controls and the blue bar are the borderlines. See in the first day, the borderlines are feeling more negatively in general uh, when they're, even after they've reappraised the negative pictures. Um, but over time, the borderline patients show a decrease 
in how negatively they're feeling. As they're uh, learning, we feel, to reappraise. Um, the healthies don't show much of a, much of a change. What's going on, uh, so this is when they're reappraising. Now there's also the look condition where they're just uh, looking at pictures and not asked to reappraise. And here um, we see first the top two lines are the subjects, the borderline subjects, this, this bar here, and the healthy controls who were in the non-training condition. These people had no training um, in distancing and you see there's very little change in their activity. Um, now, this is the two groups in the look condition. So they've been, the borderline, these two groups have been trained in distancing, but now they're reporting when they're not asked to distance, they're just asked to look. And um, so there's not much change in the healthies. We were surprised initially to find that the borderline patients, even when they weren't asked to distance, showed a drop in their negative activity. Um, but then when we thought about this, we thought that there's a kind of spillover effect, that the borderline patients were trained to distance, and even when they weren't asked explicitly to consciously distance, they were doing that. And actually this may be quite good because it may show that it becomes more automatic. Um, so let me show you what's going on in the brain. So in doing a whole brain analysis, looking at condition, look versus distance, by group, by time, day one to day five, we found um, a difference in this region here, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is one of the regions I showed you before is implicated in reappraisal. And let me show you what's going on. Uh, these are the healthy subjects on day one before training. The green bar is the activation in this region when they're looking at neutral pictures the red bar is when they're looking at negative pictures, and the blue bar is when they're reappraising for negative pictures. So you see that the healthy subjects, when they're reappraising, bring on this region, they activate this region, as we'd expect. What are the borderline patients doing on day one? Well, you see the borderline patients um, are not, not really activating this region when they're trying to reappraise, there's no difference. What happens after five days of training? Well, this is the borderline patients after five days of training. And you see that there is a big increase in activation in this region when they're reappraising. And this picture starts to look a lot more like healthy people before they're trained at all. Um, so in this sample, uh, we get almost statistical significance. It's not a, this, is, this seven should be up there. Um, it's not a big, uh, it's not as big a sample. Um, and this is healthy people uh, after five days of training. The reason there may be less activity here is the healthy people are getting more practice. Their brain may be more efficient and so they may be bringing it on less. Um, to just go quickly, we found the same effect on the um, right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex as we found on the left and in the amygdala um, you see the borderline patients on day one don't show much don't show a significant drop in amygdala activity when they're reappraising but after training there is a significant drop in amygdala activity when reappraising we also looked at the association between changes in amygdala activity from day one to day five in the borderline patients and how much of a drop there was in their negative uh, ratings of the pictures. And we found that the more amygdala attenuation with distancing training, the greater there was a drop in their negative affect reports. So, um, so this is half of our data set, so it's preliminary data. Um, but what are some of the conclusions we can draw? It looks like with training in reappraisal by distancing, borderline patients can reduce their subjective negative reactions to the aversive pictures. And the training in distancing leads to decreases in amygdala activity um, when looking at the negative pictures and distancing, and also increases in activity in the top-down regulatory region of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Um, and the results, 
after training was that the borderline showed neural activation patterns that looked like healthy people before training. So future directions, uh, certainly to uh, confirm these findings with uh, a logger, not a beer sample, but a, a larger sample, um, and to examine um, this effect in a psychopathological control group. This same study included an equal number of patients with avoidant personality disorder. We wanted to look at whether or not this effect generalized to other personality disorders. We'll be analyzing that data, and maybe next year we can present the avoidant. Um, and then uh, to contrast the tactic of distancing to situational reappraisal, uh, to determine how enduring this effect is. We do have data two weeks later, so we can see at least if it endures for two weeks. Um, and so an implication of this work is that reappraisal training or some form of reappraisal training may have a role as one component in the psychotherapeutic training, in psychotherapeutic treatment of borderline patients. And I think from a sort of a larger perspective, it points to how neuroimaging findings can be used to kind of direct us to ideas, new ideas about uh, psychotherapeutic training. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, my group. Um, this is the Mood and Personality Disorders group. There's Aaron over there also. And um, uh, uh, Maria Lopez is not in this picture, but she's in this room. It's a part and part of the group. And I uh, want to thank uh, all the people who've been involved in our research program and uh, the NIMH uh, for funding us. And thank you uh, for listening.